Since 1995, over 26,000 international students from all walks of life join the British Investigators' training courses in anomalous phenomena within ufology, paranormal and supernatural, parapsychological study, anomalous phenomena, science, hypnotherapy, spiritualism, astrology, astronomy, cryptozoology and many other areas. Our certified self-study courses will teach you how to assess, analyze, engage, formulate, document and be cognizant of all types of phenomena. Suitable for light workers and star seeds, curious personalities and inquisitive minds, skeptics alike and truth seekers. For more information, please visit www.stellaruniversity.com. With regard to history and how we've looked at our past, Atlantis has been a very popular uh, subject of interest. Um, next to, it is the second most written about topic next to love, and uh, there have been 3,000 books published on Atlantis. Today I noticed there's even a comic book called The Atlantis Avengers um, that is available. In, in my research about Atlantis, and I have been interested in this topic uh, for a long period of time, I found that there are a lot of people in history who've been very interested as well. The Pri Prime Minister Gladstone in the late 1800s, um, at the time of Queen Victoria, tried to convince the Parliament of England to fund some research, some scientific research in Atlantis. In 1898, there were some underwater uh, cable run, the first across the Atlantic, and there have been some studies of, of what was found in that. There was a woman that I have heard about in my research uh, as I have traveled to the Bahamas as a vacation spot as well uh, to do as well as the place where I do more and more research on Atlantis. Uh, there's a woman by the name of, of uh, Dr. Doris Johnson who died in the early 80s who was uh, a head of the Senate in the Bahamas and who founded the Bahamas Antiquities Institute who had done some research on Bimini and in the Bahamas as a possible site for a piece of this lost continent of Atlantis. Today, I want to introduce Terry Malman. Terry, welcome. Thank you, and a pleasure to be here. Terry is an underwater archaeologist. He has worked with the uh, famous Dr. George Bass, who was uh, involved with the University of Pennsylvania, certainly highly respected uh, archaeological work throughout the world. Um, Terry, you did your work at Texas A&M, is that right? That's correct. Um, at the Institute of Underwater Archaeology. Right, nautical archaeology, actually. Of nautical archaeology, right. okay. I understand that underwater archaeology is a relatively new field, is that right? Yes, it is, Linda. Actually, uh, Dr. George Bass was the first person to do, the first archaeologist to do a systematic underwater excavation uh, in this case, it was on a shipwreck, a uh, 3,200-year-old shipwreck off the coast of Turkey in 1961. And he was given a presidential medal for doing that by John Kennedy uh, at the time. So in terms of scientific disciplines, uh, it's less than 30 years old, which is a relatively new science. Well, we're glad to have you with us Thank to you. be able to share some of your experiences. Terry has worked in Greece as... Um, well as in the Bahamas on the, doing some research on what remains may be the lost continent of Atlantis. I, as I said, have been interested in this for 25 years myself, and I've been actively involved in the last couple years and have done some work with Dmitry Rebikov, um, with the Rebikov Institute of Marine Technology, and we'll talk more about that later. So today we'll be contributing as well as asking questions. We're going to explore Atlantis with a variety of formats. The first is Atlantis in literature, since there have been so many books. And then the second is through some psychic information. And the third, through science, uh, because uh, it seems that we all m want to be able to touch something in a tangible way before we're able to accept it. And so we do want to know what's happening with science. Terry, would you want to start with literature with the oldest source that uh, I'm sure you're familiar with, that I know I've, I've read, but I'm not as nearly as familiar with, with Plato? 
Yes, Linda, as, as we were talking about, uh, we have the slide of the, uh, from Plato's dialogue with the, the ten concentric rings of king, kingship on the city of Poseidia in Atlantis. And this is talked about in Plato's dialogue. Also, from Plato's dialogue, we, we get a picture of the life in terms of the daily life in terms of Atlantis. He goes into a great deal of description about their uh, way of life, uh, what, the, what they did, what they raised in terms of crops and, and this sort of thing. And I believe that we have a slide which uh, indicates uh, the kind of architecture they had, the type of clothing they might have worn. And in fact, it looks very much like what we would think of it in terms of an idyllic existence in the Garden of Eden. Uh, there are many, many researchers who believe that maybe Atlantis was the original Garden of Eden. Uh, that's up for speculation, but certainly it's one theory. As a lot of our speculation is about the that's Garden of Eden. That's exactly <laughs> true. And that's exactly true. And so, there again, we have a lot of, of controversy involved in this, in this whole subject, but I would highly recommend anyone interested in the subject of Atlantis to try to go back and read those two dialogues uh, of Plato's called the Timaeus and the Critias, which can be found in translation in, in many uh, uh, classical uh, uh, books on classical uh, Greek literature. Now, Plato set Atlantis west of the Pillars of Hercules or the Straits of Gibraltar, which is out, out in, in the, the Atlantic. Atlantic Ocean. That's but correct. there, there have been some theories that set it in the Mediterranean. Now, you wrote a paper on on one of the, something about work in Greece or did some work in Greece. Can you share that with us? Uh, yes, Linda, I'd be happy to. The the point being there that um, in the in the late 1960s, a theory was advanced by Dr. Angelos Galanopoulos, uh, who was in fact a Greek seismologist or volcanologist. Uh, he studied, in other words, earthquakes and volcanoes. He was not an archaeologist or a marine uh, underwater archaeologist, um, but he advanced a theory that Plato's dialogue was was really uh, about a civilization in the Aegean on the island of Thera. And the, the way he got to that point was that he said that there was a translational error in the dialogue uh, from, from the time when Solon, I, might, I should say that Solon actually, this dialogue is about Solon's visit to Egypt in 500 BC, and then Plato was, was the one who wrote the story down and is telling it through the, the vehicle of these dialogues. Uh, Angelos Galanopoulos believed in what he called the tenfold error theory. In other words, he believed there was a translational error between the priests in Egypt that Solon was, was talking with and Solon himself, that there was a miscommunication so that all figures over a thousand were off by a factor of ten. That means all dates, all dimensions, all figures over a thousand were off by a factor of ten. Hence, you have the name. You said it much more recently. Exactly, and and not only much more recently, but but make Atlantis much smaller. It would make Atlantis into an island, rather oh. than the continent that Plato actually believed it was, or or actually described it to be. So, but there again, this becomes very convenient if you're uh, a Greek uh, seismologist to locate it on a Greek island. I think there's a certain amount of nationalism involved there, or national pride involved in that. But basically, Angelo Scalinopoulos knew that there was a, a great volcanic eruption on the island of Thera in 1485 BC and set out to try to make Plato's dialogue somehow fit the incident of this eruption. And I think we have some slides to, to show of the volcanic eruptions on the island of Thera. And as you're looking at the slides, you can see that there certainly was a very strong volcanic eruption. You can see in the slides that there are, in some cases, several hundred feet of volcanic ash that uh, cover the island. In the slides that we have, you'll also see that there are, in fact, some very important archaeological remains on this island. But they are remains uh, of a Minoan nature. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, an advanced civilization that existed uh, 
Bronze Age civilization that ex existed in the Aegean at that time. We have some slides of, of their... Uh, and so how old are the Minoans? If Atlantis is 10 to 12,000 years ago, the Minoans are... Well, basically, uh, the Minoans, uh, we're talking about a period of time which was roughly the uh, 15th century uh, B.C. In, okay. in the Aegean. Uh, that is a basic target date, although they were before and after that period as well. But certainly they started to uh, disappear by the, by the 12th uh, century B.C. And so the, this civilization uh, was much, much younger than the civilization that Plato talked about. And obviously it was a much smaller area. And there again also a different location entirely than what Plato talked about. Plato, as you mentioned, placed it to the west of the Pillars of Hercules, meaning what, what we know as the Straits of Gibraltar today, whereas Angelos Galanopoulos placed it to the east of the Pillars of Hercules in the Aegean Sea. So actually there are uh, several great differences between uh, Plato's dialogue and the thera <coughs> excuse me, the thera hypothesis which places it in, in the uh, uh, Aegean Sea on the island of Thera. Now, I should say also, Linda, that that is not to downgrade the uh, archaeological discoveries on the island of Thera because there are some very, very significant remains, as we've seen in our slides, of both architecture and uh, frescoes and uh, Minoan pottery on the island of Thera. But personally, I do not believe that they relate to Atlantis, per se. And there are frescoes, aren't there, of uh, people coming on ships yes. that the Minoans had. Yes. So, in fact, it could be of an earlier time, yet, that they were referring. That's exactly uh, correct. They may have been remembering in their frescoes, may have been depict depicting or remembering uh, an earlier uh, migration from another location to the island of Thera. Along, along with, uh, th let's move then, if we've gone from like Plato to, um, uh, as a source of literature, then to uh, a Greek archaeologist, and also your interest in that area, to Donnelly, who was an American who researched Atlantis, and it, this is his book, Atlantis, the Antediluvian World. He had some basic propositions in this book, and I would like to read them. This book was published in 1882. I would like to also mention that Ignatius Donnelly was a congressman of the United States from Minnesota. Uh, so what, what I have found in my research over the years is that there are very serious-minded people interested in Atlantis. It, it, it is not just for... Uh, um, people sitting in libraries doing research all the time, or, I mean, they're, they're people who are, um, who are very involved in the government and business. These are the propositions of Ignatius Donnelly, written in 1882, that there once existed in the Atlantic Ocean, opposite the mouth of the Mediterranean Sea, a large island which was the remnant of an Atlantic continent and known to the ancient world as Atlantis. Number two, that the description of this island given by Plato is not and has been long, as has been long supposed fable, but veritable history. Three, that Atlantis was the region where man first rose from a state of barbarism to civilization. Four, that it became in the course of ages a populous and mighty nation from whose overflowings the shores of the Gulf of Mexico, the Mississippi River, the Amazon, the Pacific coast of South America, the Mediterranean, the west coast of Europe and Africa, the Baltic, the Black Sea, and the Caspian were populated by civilized nations. Number five, that it was the true antediluvian world, the Garden of Eden, the gardens of the Hesperides, the Elysian fields, the gardens of Alcinus, the Mesopolis, the Olympus, the Asgard of the traditions of the ancient nations, representing a universal memory of a great land where early mankind dwelt for ages in peace and happiness. Number six, that the gods and goddesses of the ancient Greeks, the Phoenicians, the Hindus, and the Scandinavians were simply the kings, queens, and heroes of Atlantis, and the acts attributed to them in mythology are a confused recollection of real historical events. Number seven, that the mythology of Egypt and Peru represented the original religion of Atlantis, which was sun worship. Number eight, that the oldest colony formed by the Atlanteans was probably in Egypt, 
whose civilization was a reproduction of that of the Atlantic island. Number nine, that the implements of the Bronze Age of Europe were derived from Atlantis, and that the Atlanteans were also the first manufacturers of iron. Number 10, that the Phoenician alphabet, parent of all the European alphabets, was derived from an Atlantis alphabet, which was also conveyed from Atlantis to the Mayas of Central America. And number 11, that Atlantis was the original seat of the Aryan or Indo-European family of nations, as well as the Semitic peoples and possibly also of the Turanian races. 12, that Atlantis perished in a terrible convulsion of nature in which the whole island sunk into the ocean with nearly all of its inhabitants. And last, number 13, that a few per persons escaped in ships and on rafts and carried to the nations east and west the tidings of the appalling catastrophe, which has survived to our own time in the flood and deluge legends of the different nations of the old and new worlds. Well, I also have, we also have Mystic Places, which is a, a series published by the Time Life books, Mysteries of the Unknown. Um, I understand, too, from Russ Adams that this is a uh, very um, hot-selling series. Here we have a slide of the flood destruction, or a drawing of that. Um, well, Linda, one thing I would like to touch on while we're on the subject of Ignatius Donnelly, uh, and I think it is a very important uh, uh, source of information for people interested in Atlantis, I would certainly recommend them uh, reading that book as well. Uh, is the fact that Ignatius Donnelly really was what we call in anthropology, archaeology, a diffusionist. In other words, he believed in the fact that uh, civilization originated, civilization as we know it, originated from a common source. In this case, he believed that common source was the continent of Atlantis in the Atlantic Ocean, and that prior to its destruction about 10,000 B.C. or 9,000 B.C., uh, we had a diffusion of people both east and west from uh, the uh, continent of Atlantis, in other words, going to North and South America, going to Europe and, and the Mideast from uh, Atlantis. Uh, that is uh, in contrast to another anthropological theory called the theory of independent or spontaneous invention, which holds that uh, because of the general nature of man, he uh, will invent things simultaneously in different parts of the world at the same time. The problem with that is that if you really subscribe to that, then you must believe that all the people of the world would have the same inventions at the same time. In other words, uh, everyone would have the, boom the boomerang, for example, at the same time, or everyone would have the bow and arrow at the same time. So there are some problems with that. I tend to subscribe myself more to the diffusionist theory, uh, okay. as Ignatius Donnelly did. And, uh, and Ignatius Donnelly, as I said, can, continues to be a major source of information, but there have been more recent uh, discoveries and more recent information put forth by a fellow uh, by the name of Charles Berlitz, who has actually uh, authored... Uh, two different books, one called The Mystery of Atlantis and, and another one called Atlantis, the uh, Eighth Continent. And these, again, uh, in terms of people reading on the subject of Atlantis, provide some very interesting insights into not only the, the scientific information about Atlantis that we've, we've been able to gather over the years, but also what we would call the psychic information or the psychic sources on Atlantis. There have been, within the last hundred years, um, there have been a lot of um, psychic readings done uh, with Atlantis as a topic. And I think one of the most important body of psychic readings was done by the American psychic Edgar Casey. And I believe we have, have a slide of uh, Edgar uh, mm -hmm. that uh, the audience can can take a look at. Edgar Casey, during the course of his lifetime, from he lived from 1878 to 1945, did uh, several thousand readings, uh, psychic readings, uh, many hundred of these, uh, over uh, two or three hundred of these readings, dealt with information on Atlantis. 
So we have a considerable body of psychic knowledge uh, oh, and here's a, coming here's from that source. Here's one of the books I see. On right. The uh, Edgar Casey on Atlantis is a very excellent source uh, for the psychic information put forth by uh, Edgar Casey in his readings. I think that material is particularly interesting for a number of reasons because in, in many respects it does coincide uh, with the scientific information that has been discovered about uh, uh, past civilizations perhaps uh, originating from Atlantis. It also pins, pinpoints an area in the Bahamas um, uh, called Bimini, which uh, Casey says is, is in fact a remnant of the lost continent of Atlantis. And uh, I believe we have a slide to indicate where Bimini is located. Uh, it's, it's about 45 miles from, from Miami, Florida. And it's one of the northernmost, as you know, having been there, one of the northernmost islands in the Bahamas chain. And that's where I have done my research in terms of Atlantis, and I, and I believe uh, you also have done research in that area. Yes, um, I have. I have not, though, yet been able to snorkel the site because of the of weather at the at the um, during the time that I was there. To I understand that, w in regard to the Casey material, that there is a um, a university, Atlantic University, uh, and they're continuing to serve as a clearinghouse for some information. And uh, I did, I did make a phone call and speak to Doug Richards, who is. Director of Research of Atlantic University, and Doug has been kind of involved in in looking at the scientific uh, information as well as the psychic information, and uh, because there is some controversy about this, about not only Bimini as a site, but about Atlantis uh, to begin with. Um, there was a scientist, a zoologist by the name of Dr. Uh, Manson Valentine who in the 60s found some geometric shapes off the coast of Bimini in, his, in some time over the Bahamas. He taught at the University of Miami in Florida, and Dr. Valentine asked cargo pilots to look as they were flying over the Bahama banks for any kind of unusual structures, and in fact, they found some over a period of time. I think we may have some slides of that, uh, Linda, if I yes. am correct. Yes, we, we do. Dr. Valentine is in his 90s now, so I have not been able to speak with him. But I have worked with a scientist by the name of Dmitry Rebikov and the Rebikov Institute of Marine Technology. Uh, Dmitry is working with uh, uh, two, um, other, or, or two other people, Dragan and Nicholas Popov, with the Bahama Family Island Expedition in actually doing some what's called photogrammetric mapping of the site. And uh, we have some aerial slides of that. The, the site called the Bimini Road looks like an, a backward J. And Dimitri does not believe that it was ever used as a road. He believes that it is underneath, underneath these, the, the huge rocks. And Terry, I don't know about this, so I'm going to ask you more about this in a few minutes. But underneath this, it, they look like lintels or like Stonehenge. Uh, Dimitri believes that there's a relationship between the two. And we have some video with Dimitri uh, talking about uh, his work on this site. We still call the Bimini site the Bimini mystery. We still photograph, we still measure, we use more and more advanced methods, better cameras, we use video, we use digital, we use 3D stereo photogrammetry, and also right now we're producing 3D stereo photogrammetry from the air. Why from the air? Because we discovered in Bimini, that was one of the few lucky things about Bimini, that our underwater camera with a correcting lens, when aimed vertically downward at the bottom, are capable of correcting the water distortion and loss of sharpness also from their plate. So now we are able to produce aerial photos that are just as sharp when the water is calm as these underwater shots of details. Then we'll be able, using again computers, to match together 
the underwater detail and the aerial general view and so to have a highly detailed general picture of the whole site of Bimini. It is an expensive enterprise. It takes time, but it's well worth it because the archaeologists, the anthropologists and historians in the whole world and especially in Europe, in the birthplace of archaeology, Paris, France, are all convinced that Bimini is one of the keys of the mystery. Really, then, we have to look offshore into the water itself, underwater, for evidences of a higher uh, civilization. And therein lies the controversy. There are uh, definitely geometric remains of some sort uh, submerged in the water at a depth of 25, 35 feet and deeper off the coast of, of Bimini. I remember that it's not that deep. Some of it is even 18. That's, that's true, Linda. That's exactly right. Some of it is, is uh, as shallow as 18 feet. Uh, but I think the point to remember about that is that the fact that it is submerged anywhere from 18 to 25, 35 feet speaks to the point that uh, these uh, remains uh, could not have been there prior to uh, any time, uh, I mean, had to be there prior to about 6,000 B.C. because that's when the area was inundated by the rising sea level. With the end of the Ice Age? With the end of the Ice Age, okay, that's correct. Okay. So that is part of the controversy uh, there, that these remains uh, are much older. But than didn't the Ice Age end around 10 to 12,000 years ago? That's or right. Or was that the beginning of it? That was the end of it, but it took a period of time for, for that to, uh, for the sea level rise to take place. And okay. it, actually the sea level since the end of the Ice Age has risen about 500 feet. Oh. So it's a considerable rise in sea level. I think the, the point of controversy uh, with regard to the Bimini site hinges around as you said the Bimini Road site, which is really a misnomer. That's, uh, we don't know that it's a road. It has the appearance of being uh, a megalithic site on the order of Stonehenge, uh, not with standing stones, but with, with uh, uh, megalithic, large, very large stones lying flat on the seafloor. Part of that whole controversy uh, involves the the controversy between are these man-made stones lying on the seafloor or are they part of a natural beach rock formation? I think that's crucial to the whole question of, of whether these are man-made remains or natural remains. In my uh, research and, and work with, with Dr. David Zink uh, in, the, in the Bahamas who has published a book called The Stones of Atlantis and he has another uh, revised new edition of this book coming out in May of, of uh, 1990. Uh, in my work with Dr. David Zink, I have been convinced uh, personally that these are in fact uh, man-made structures of some sort. They are not naturally occurring beach rock. Uh, naturally occurring beach rock, as you might expect, occurs on a slope uh, as, as part of the beach and it, it normally is although there is sometimes a geometric shape to it, is normally very irregular uh, shaped. And I believe we have some slides to demonstrate that fact of the naturally occurring beach rock opposed to the uh, obviously geometric shapes of these blocks which are underwater off the coast of Bimini. Uh, the blocks underwater, as we see in the slides and the, and the video from Dmitry Rybakov, uh, are several feet thick and they are in uh, four or five feet square in many, in many cases. And so how thick is normally occurring beach rock? Normally, the beach rock uh, occurs on the beach uh, is not, it's not more than six to eight inches thick at the most. And is beach rock composed of the same um, elements as, as these rocks? Well, that's a, that's a very important issue, Linda. As a matter of fact, uh, in, in this case, uh, they are not. The corings that have been done both by Dr. David Zink and Dmitry Rybakov have, have demonstrated that there is a significant difference in the mineral content 
of the blocks that are lying flat on the seafloor, the, uh, the, the Bimini Road site uh, that we spoke about, there's significant differences in the content of those rocks as opposed to the naturally occurring beach rock. And so I think that's a very important point to keep in mind, that not only are these geometric uh, shaped blocks, uh, they are also significantly different in their content from naturally occurring beach rock. So uh, in, in terms of the Bimini Road site, that site, as you mentioned, is a, is a J type of a J pattern, but it runs for 1,800 feet underwater before it makes the, the bend in the J. So it's, it's a considerable line of, of parallel blocks, which is, I might add, run entirely counter to the natural fractures in the sea floor. We have geometric blocks, and we also, I believe, have some slides of this, of the blocks themselves sitting on the, on the sea floor, but we have running in diagonal patterns underneath that naturally occurring fractures in the seafloor so that the blocks themselves actually run counter to these fractures. Now that's not what you would expect if this was naturally occurring beach rock. You would expect that the fractures in the, in the, in the rocks themselves would follow the fractures in the, in the seafloor, and this is not the case. In, in the Bimini site. Uh, well, tell me about, I don't, what is radiocarbon-14 dating? What is that process, or what are the, uh, can you... Radiocarbon-14 dating, uh, then, is a type of dating used in archaeology to, uh, it, it basically uh, revolves around the half-life of, of carbon-14, all, since all uh, living things involve carbon, uh, there is a method of dating called the carbon-14, which will we know in a prescribed manner how this deteriorates in a, in a, in a given um, artifact or in, a, or in a given organic material. We know how it deteriorates. And we can, through a formula, we can determine how much of that has deteriorated over a period of years and therefore how old that artifact is or that organic uh, substance is. The problem with doing that type of dating underwater is that the, the water tends to throw the dating process off in, in carbon-14. In other words, it, it makes an artifact, it gives a, a younger date for, for an artifact than the actual date, so that we might get a date of an artifact that has been underwater of, of 5,000 years B.C., when in fact that artifact came from seven or 8,000 years B.C. So is that how I've heard of mummies and things being found, or things being found in peat bogs that are, in fact, more well-preserved than, than they would be? So just the fact that they're more well-preserved, uh, that the water has a preservation quality to it, um, different from erosion or decomposition that would happen that, That's correct. In the the air. Water, in certain cases, has... Uh, uh, has a preservation quality, and, and it depends what type of environment you find an artifact in, how well you can date the artifact, okay. or how well it is preserved. The, the environment in which an artifact is found is very, very important. And I might mention, in the Bimini area, uh, Dr. David Zink has found uh, what I believe are two or three worked stone artifacts, and I believe we have slides of that, uh, which have also been uh, analyzed by the American Museum of, of Natural History. And they, as well, indicated, uh, one of the expeditions that I was on, uh, had discovered one of these uh, worked stone artifacts, uh, that they were, in fact, uh, exactly that, worked stone artifacts. And these artifacts were found at a depth of 35 feet underwater, submerged in the sand. So there is reason to believe that there was something going on there, that there was a civilization, and it, as you can see from the slides, this is a very sophisticated kind of uh, technology that we're talking about. It's, it's a tongue and groove architecture, or it's a tongue and groove uh, block that we, that we have uh, found down there. And that's a very sophisticated type of technology to have, much more sophisticated than the Arawak Indians that supposedly inhabited that area around 1000 A.D. So we have, I guess what I'm saying, Lynn, is we have a mystery there that needs to be unraveled. And I think that's where the, uh, 
the whole mystery of, of science and technology uh, so, will so, help. So let's talk about that a little bit. Or I, I'd heard Dimitri say, and from some of the reading I've done, that the corings taken from the rock this rock would have had to have been above land 10 to 12,000 years ago from some of the information because it would have not weathered in the water that way. Is that, is that true or are you saying that the dating is probably not or, or hard to pinpoint? Well, the dating in fact is, uh, is a little difficult to pinpoint, Linda, but we have had radiocarbon-14 dating on, uh, done on that artifact uh, as well as some other material there, which, which gives a date of uh, 7,200 years uh, BP, in other words, before present. So we're, okay. we're talking about uh, an artifact that may be 9,000 years old. Okay. And, and that at least gives us a ballpark figure. And that ballpark figure is much, much older than what we normally have thought about as the Arawak Indians occupying the area in 1000 AD. So we certainly have some reason to believe that there has been at one time a significant uh, culture in that area sometime around uh, 9,000 years ago. Well, I, I um, understood from a brief conversation with Doug Richards that there's a Bill Keegan who does archeology span work in the Bahamas, not, uh, not with regard to anything with Atlantis, but why, haven't, why hasn't archaeology or the, uh, the serious, um, the more the mainstream archaeologists been interested? Or why haven't, why don't we know more about this? Certainly the public's been interested, but every time um, it seems to be brought up with the mainstream archaeologists, they're not in, they're very skeptical. Well, Linda, I think a lot of it just revolves around the, the controversy of the whole subject. In, in, in many cases, um, archaeologists like to stay with something that is rather safe, rather, rather conservative in, in a lot of respects. They don't want to upset the apple cart, so to speak. Uh, if, in fact, it can be proved that there was an, a, an advanced technology in the Bimini area uh, at this period of time, it would certainly upset the whole chronology, the archaeological cr chronology, not only of that area, but of the world itself. Sort of like of Mesopotamia being the cradle of civilization. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. So it would, it would it throw into chaos what has been normally accepted archaeological chronology. And as Ignatius Donnelly points out, he believes that Atlantis was, was the source of the, of the Egyptian uh, civilization, of the, the uh, Mayan, the Aztec, uh, uh, many of the, uh, what we would call the civilized or people. Or even as they the diffused of the coast of Ireland during that's Asia. correct right. and into the Canary Islands and so forth and so on so it uh, it really is a source of controversy that that most archaeologists um, just feel is too hot to handle right now well a couple years ago when I was checking this out I went to the video store and rented the Jacques Cousteau film search for Atlantis I think was the name of it and uh, it, I was really disappointed in that film because it didn't seem right to me or it seemed like he hadn't checked out a lot of the areas. Now since then I found out that the Greek tourist uh, board was involved in funding that film. So that says something to me about the purity of some of the, I mean we all come at things from certain biases. But uh, had, had you heard that also? Have, I'm sure you've seen that. Yes, Linda, I have seen it. And there again, it is uh, talking about the Thera hypothesis that I spoke about earlier, which obviously is good for the Greek government. It's good for tourism to say that Atlantis existed on the Greek island of Thera or Santorini. So there again, someone has an ax to grind with that particular issue and, and having it placed in that particular location. Uh, there are a lot of, you know, vested interests even in uh, vested interest groups that would like to see Atlantis located in their particular part of the world. So you also have that little problem to deal with. Uh, so, but I think, I think the significant point to bear in mind is that why is it important in the first place to try to prove the existence of Atlantis? We keep coming back to, to the answer to that question is that 
if we can prove that Atlantis existed, whether it existed in the Atlantic Ocean, uh, as Plato and, and Donnelly believed, uh, in Berlitz, for example, or it existed somewhere else, uh, if we can prove that it existed at this remote period of time, in, in 10,000 BC was the final destruction of Atlantis, if we can prove that that high civilization existed at that time, then I think we have to take a very broad view of, of our history, and another very, very hard look at our history, what, uh, the history of the world I'm speaking about now, in terms of reevaluating everything uh, that had gone, uh, gone before us in terms of the chronology. What, you know, it's, it's going to shake up a lot of people, and I think that is something that maybe should be done. Well, it seems to me that if we found out that there was a civilization that was technologically advanced um, and it's civilized, if we consider ourselves, although I read the other day that there are 35,000 children who die on our planet for lack of food and that we spend $800 billion in defense in, in military uh, equipment. So I wonder what the definition of civilized is. But if, in fact, we find out that there was a civilization that lived back then and that uh, was destroyed or that, you know, that perhaps abused uh, the technology or the power that they had in that form, then it could, this could be uh, a, a doorway that we could go through. I mean, if we, if we look back at our ancestors as not being uh, all Cro-Magnon people or all primitive people and see that, in fact, they, our history may be very different. I think it could open up a whole new future for us. I mean, that's why I'm interested. Well, I believe that's exactly right, Linda. And, and my personal philosophy of that is, and I think being, being an archaeologist, that maybe this has come home even stronger, that I believe that we cannot truly know where we're going until we know where we have been. And I think in proving the existence of Atlantis or, or disproving it. But if we were to prove the existence of Atlantis, it would certainly show us where we have been in the past and at what level we have been in the past. And if, if that type of civilization can disappear for all intents and purposes without a trace, then it's something that we need to look at. Uh, as Plato said, they disappeared because of the abuse of power and technology. Then it's something that we need to look at uh, in the same light, are we abusing the technology that we have? Are we abusing the environment? Uh, are we abusing our power as a civilized, uh, quote, civilized uh, country? There may, be, there may be a moral lesson in all this for us. And I think that's really part of the reason for the whole interest. Well, we need to uh, fund science some more to help us out with this. Terry, thank that's you for joining us. Thank today. you. It's been a uh, classical uh, uh, books on classical uh, Greek literature. Now, Plato set Atlantis west of the Pillars of Hercules or the Straits of Gibraltar, which is out, out in, in the, the Atlantic. Atlantic Ocean. That's but correct. But there, there have been some theories that set it in the Mediterranean. Now, you wrote a paper on on one of the, something about work in Greece or did some work in Greece. Can you share that with us? Uh, yes, Linda, I'd be happy to. The the point being there that um, in, the, in the late 1960s, a theory was advanced by Dr. Angelos Galanopoulos, uh, who was in fact a Greek seismologist or volcanologist. Uh, he studied, in other words, earthquakes and volcanoes. He was not an archaeologist or a marine uh, underwater archaeologist. Um, but he advanced a theory that Plato's dialogue was, was really uh, about a civilization in the Aegean on the island of Thera. And the, the way he got to that point was that he said that there was a translational error in the dialogue uh, from, from the time when Solon, I might, I should say that Solon actually, this dialogue is about Solon's visit to Egypt in 500 BC, and then Plato was, was the one who wrote the story down and is telling it through the, the vehicle of these dialogues. Uh, Angelos Galanopoulos believed in what he called the tenfold error theory. In other words, 
he believed there was a translation. Since 1995, over 26,000 international students from all walks of life joined the British investigators' training courses in anomalous phenomena within ufology, paranormal and supernatural, parapsychological study, anomalous phenomena, science, hypnotherapy, spiritualism, astrology, astronomy, cryptozoology, and many other areas. Our certified self-study courses will teach you how to assess, analyze, engage, formulate, document, and be cognizant of all types of phenomena. Suitable for light workers and star seeds, curious personalities and inquisitive minds, skeptics alike and truth seekers. For more information, please visit www.stellaruniversity.com. With regard to history and how we've looked at our past, Atlantis has been a very popular uh, subject of interest. Um, next to, it is the second most written about topic next to love, and uh, there have been 3,000 books published on Atlantis. Today I noticed there's even a comic book called The Atlantis Avengers um, that is available. In, in my research about Atlantis, and I have been interested in this topic uh, for a long period of time, I found that there are a lot of people in history who've been very interested. Yes, it is, Linda. Actually, uh, Dr. George Bass was the first person to do, the first archaeologist to do a systematic underwater excavation. Uh, in this case, it was on a shipwreck, a uh, 3,200-year-old shipwreck off the coast of Turkey in 1961. And he was given a presidential medal for doing that by John Kennedy uh, at the time. So. In terms of scientific disciplines, uh, it's less than 30 years old, which is a relatively new science. Well, we're glad to have you with us Thank to you. be able to share some of your experiences. Terry has worked in Greece as um, well as in the Bahamas on the, doing some research on what remains may be the lost continent of Atlantis. I, as I said, have been interested in this for 25 years myself, and I've been actively involved in the last couple years, and have done some work with Dmitry Rebikov, um, with the Rebikov Institute of Marine Technology, and we'll talk more about that later. So today we'll be contributing as well as asking questions. We're going to explore Atlantis with a variety of formats. The first is Atlantis in literature, since there have been so many books, and then the second is through some psychic information and the third through science uh, because uh, it seems that we all want to be able to touch something in a tangible way before we're able to accept it and so we do want to know what's happening with science terry would you want to start with literature with the oldest source that uh, i'm sure you're familiar with as well the Pri prime minister gladstone in the late 1800s um, at the time of Queen Victoria, tried to convince the Parliament of England to fund some research, some scientific research in Atlantis. In 1898, there were some underwater uh, cable run, the first across the Atlantic, and there have been some studies of, of what was found in that. There was a woman that I have heard about in my research uh, as I have traveled to the Bahamas as a vacation spot as well, uh, to do as well as the place where I do more and more research on Atlantis. Uh, there's a woman by the name of, of uh, Dr. Doris Johnson who died in the early 80s, who was uh, a head of the Senate in the Bahamas and who founded the Bahamas Antiquities Institute, who had done some research on Bimini and in the Bahamas as a possible site for a piece of this lost continent of Atlantis. Today, I want to introduce Terry Malman. Terry, welcome. Thank you, and a pleasure to be here. Terry is an underwater archaeologist. He has worked with the uh, famous Dr. George Bass, who was uh, involved with the University of Pennsylvania, certainly highly respected uh, archaeological work throughout the world. Um, Terry, you did your work at Texas A&M, is that right? That's correct. Um, at the Institute of Underwater Archaeology. Right, nautical archaeology, actually. Of nautical archaeology, right. okay. I understand that underwater archaeology is a relatively new field, is that right? Familiar with that I know I've 
I've read, but I'm not as nearly as familiar with, with Plato. Yes, Linda, as, as we were talking about, uh, we have the slide of the, uh, from Plato's dialogue with the, the ten concentric rings of king, kingship on the city of Poseidia in Atlantis, and this is talked about in Plato's dialogue. Also, from Plato's dialogue, we, we get a picture of the life in terms of the daily life in terms of Atlantis. He goes into a great deal of description about their uh, way of life, uh, what, the, what they did, what they raised in terms of crops and, and this sort of thing. And I believe that we have a slide which uh, indicates uh, the kind of architecture they had, the type of clothing they might have worn. And in fact, it looks very much like what we would think of it in terms of an idyllic existence in the Garden of Eden. Uh, there are many, many researchers who believe that maybe Atlantis was the original Garden of Eden. Uh, that's up for speculation, but certainly it's one theory. As a lot of our speculation is about the that's Garden of Eden. That's exactly <laughs> true. And that's exactly true. And so, there again, we have a lot of, of controversy involved in this, in this whole subject, but I would highly recommend anyone interested in the subject of Atlantis to try to go back and read those two dialogues uh, of Plato's called the Timaeus and the Critias, which can be found in translation in, in many uh, 